morning, everyone. That didn't sound very enthusiastic this morning. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, that's better. That's better. That's good. That, I, I needed that, too. I needed that reminder, too. It's a gray day, right? So we're glad to have all of you here with us in worship this morning. Um, do we have any announcements that we would like to share? Yeah, Daddy. Next Saturday, October the 5th at 8 a.m. is the men's breakfast. If you're available to come to that, we'd love to have you. Please sign up on the sign-up sheet so that we know how many people are planning on being here for that. Also, if you're interested in joining or uh, contributing to the Friends of India Network, you may do so. There are envelopes in the uh, entryway if you would like to do that. If you're making a check, please make that out to the church, and then one large check will be cut and sent to the ministry. Other announcements we'd like to make this morning? Do we have any joys and concerns we'd like to share today? Yeah, Judy. Jason's birthday is tomorrow. Happy birthday, Jason. Peggy. Please pray for Peggy's friend, Lee Sadowski, who lost her house um, in, the, in the hurricane. Karen. Please pray for Brian Nicholas. Um, he's dealing with um, some diabetes things. Yeah, Linda. Lily Catherine Moore has been born. That's Linda and Bill's new great-granddaughter. Congratulations. Do we have any others? Yeah, Maddie. Willem and Riley celebrated their birthdays this week. Happy birthday to you guys. There's Riley. Any others? Let's continue with prayer this morning. Father, as we come before you this morning, we have our joys and we have our burdens that we lay before your feet. Lord, we ask that you focus our minds and our hearts only on you as we worship you. May we focus and think about you and, fo and learn the things that you would have us learn. We ask all this in your most precious and holy name. Amen. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. Your word, O Lord, revives the soul. You make wise the simple. You enlighten our eyes. Please stay standing for our praise music this morning. The truth is I've been wondering since my very first day. I know the only reason I can stand here unashamed. It's not because I'm worthy. It's all because of mercy. There's no way that I could earn it. Praise God, my dad is paid. It's not because I'm worthy.
may be seated. We come before the Lord bringing our joys and our concerns and also we confess that which to him which is improper in our lives. Please join me as we read together the call the prayer of confession as it's printed in your bulletin. Merciful Lord, we confess that we have sought greatness at the expense of servanthood. We have considered ourselves great while those who are poor and hurting have stood among us with outstretched hands. We confess that we have kept for ourselves that which you have given us so that we might share. Destroy our sin of self-centeredness and replace it with a desire to put others ahead of ourselves. Send your Holy Spirit that we might trust in your power and in the assurance of your goodness. Amen. Please join now in a time of silent prayer.
The scripture tells us that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I declare that through the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross, your sins have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. If you would take a seat for a minute, and I have some <clears throat> announcements that then we'll go to the passing of the peace. Uh, first of all, I want to commend the congregation on the uh, fact that as of last Sunday or Monday when we counted the funds toward the Friends of Indian Network, M.K. Baharte's ministry in India, the church had contributed $4,831. Now the session determined at its meeting early in the month that it would match uh, whatever amount that the congregation contributed up to $7,500. Today is the last day for collecting the funds for FOIN. I'm challenging you as a congregation to make $5,000, meaning we're $169 short of $5,000. If we make $5,000 contributed, uh, then the session will match that five, and $10,000 will go to the work of bringing people to Christ and children going to school at a Christian school in India and the multiple ministries of training hundreds of ministers and male and female to go to villages in India that was all described by M.K. Baharte. So I think we're only $169 away. Uh, you may have in the pew rack an, an envelope that has F-O-I-N, Friends of India, on it, or they'll be on the table outside. And let's prayerfully uh, support this and see if we can make that goal of 5000 I think it would be a wonderful achievement for missions. Secondly, uh, I, I want to thank everyone for their uh, kind words of support. I've see, received by email, phone calls, and cards. I appreciate uh, very much people praying and thinking ab about me. As you can see, I'm making slow progress. But I'm making progress. And so I thank the Lord for that, and uh, eventually I'll be doing the Irish jig again. But uh, what I've discovered, I had this surgery done on my right hip six years ago. Here it is six years later. And you know what? As you get older, the harder it is to heal. And so it's coming slow, but the Lord is good. And my wife keeps saying, don't give up, don't give up. That was when we were sizing out my casket. Uh, no, that's just a joke, but she's a great encourager. Finally, uh, I was going to start a class, teaching a class, the seven churches of Revelation, uh, on this Sunday, but due to my surgery and the recovery, uh, I will not be beginning that class in the fellowship hall at 9 o'clock uh, on Sunday, October 20th, and that will be for seven weeks. Uh, the seven churches of Revelation, which are in chapters 2 and 3, are extremely valuable because they paint a picture of what was happening in the early church, the challenges they were confronting. And yet, when you study them 
and you realize what John the writer is saying to them and what Christ is saying to the early churches, those messages are the same messages to the church today. So to look at it and study it and understand that what was challenging those first Christians continues to challenge Christians in the world today. It gives us a perspective. It gives us hope. It gives us encouragement because we are reminded that what Christ promised those churches who were suffering and having problems is the same promise he gives to us today. So I invite all of you, the class is about 45 minutes long on a Sunday morning, and we do serve uh, breakfast. So, uh, and the cost is very reasonable. Everybody get it? Zero. So you can't use the excuse, oh, I have to eat before I come. We'll fill you up. So that will start again October 20th. Uh, that concludes my messages, uh, personal messages, and I invite you now to stand and greet one another. Good to see you. <clears throat> yeah. So, but we brought somebody new today. Good, so wonderful. Back. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, I had that one done six years ago, and this one done three weeks ago. Oh, look at you. Oh, you gave me cake. <laughs> Thank you. I'm coming down. I, I don't want to uh, be in front of the choir. Of...
row or first two rows, please. Where are you guys going? <laughs> yeah, I know how you feel. I want to tell you a story about kindness and the importance of kindness. It happened to my wife and I this week. We went to uh, a restaurant to eat, and it's actually Chili's. Does any of you go to Chili's? Been to Chili's? Yeah. Well, we after we were finished eating, this was my first day of walking on a cane. I wasn't very steady, and here's this old man and. The, my wife, we're leaving Chili's now, coming out towards the double doors to get through. I looked coming into the Chili's at, the, at that moment as I was slowly walking that day, my first day on a cane. I know I look slow now, but I was even slower then. I looked and I saw six big guys, high school guys, coming into Chili's. They looked like the football team of Butler. They had football shirts on and shorts. It looked like they had just come from practice, and, they are, and now they were coming to Chili's for dinner. And I thought, oh, no, I'm not very steady on my cane. Here come six big bullies that normally, if I didn't have my cane, I'd knock them all down. No, that's <laughs> not true. I thought, these guys are just going to come rushing through, and I don't, I don't go in reverse yet. And so I said, this is not going to work out very well because my wife is only this tall and she's not going to knock down these six big football players. Well, then a miracle happened. The six boys, young men I should say, divided in half on the walkway. Three got on this side, three got on the other side, one opened the door for me and they let me through. And I thought, how kind and considerate of these young men to let me, a, an old man walking with a cane, come through. And as I walked through, I fe felt I had to say s something kind to them. And I said, thank you, young men. You are gentlemen and scholars. And they all laughed. <laughs> well. They took the time to be kind. <laughs> well, at least he's holding the Christian flag. That's all I can. <laughs> Jesus tells us to take the time to be kind. Being kind is a way to show Christian love. Jesus was famous for his kindness. Did you realize that? Some people think, well, he did great miracles, and people wanted to see that. He was famous for that. Other people liked his teaching, and they went to hear him for that reason. And still others know the story that he died on the cross and he resurrected, and he's famous for that. But he also showed kindness. Let me give you some illustrations. One time Jesus was walking in, into a village, and the children came rushing up to see him. They already knew about this Jesus. But in those days, children were supposed to be kept at a distance from famous people and teachers. And so the disciples pushed the, dis the children away. But what did Jesus say? Precisely, let the children come to me. They sensed his kindness. There's another story. I won't go through all the stories. 
but a woman who was, had been very sick for years and had sought many doctors and didn't have any money and couldn't get healed any longer. And she heard that Jesus was coming through her village. So the crowds had gathered as Jesus walked through the village. She couldn't get near him. So she got on her knees and she crawled and she touched his garment to get healed. And Jesus immediately said, who touched me? And they brought the woman forward because they thought Jesus was going to scold her. And he, and he said, woman, you are healed. He was kind to her where others were trying to be mean. And you go through the Bible, the stories in the Gospels, and you see that Jesus was not only famous for his miracles and his teachings, but it was because of his kindness that the people said he's not like the scribes and the Pharisees. He shows us love of God. And the one way he did that was by his kindness. So we are to be kind to one another. And the Bible says, particularly, we are to be kind to those in the church. These are our brothers and sisters in Christ. So we learn how to be kind in a community of kindness. As people are kind to one another, showing Christian love, then we become kind to, to them as well. Well, I'm going to put a challenge before you this week. And Mrs. Dunn has something. Come forward, if you would, uh, Connie. I have some kindness stickers. I'm going to give each of you two kindness stickers. Mrs. Dunn will give each of you two kindness stickers. Now, you can start passing them around. Now, what I want you to do with your kindness stickers is don't take them off and peel them off so you can stick them on you yet. What I'd like you to do, and this requires a little bit of memory, but when you do an act of kindness this week to somebody else, I want you to remember that, and next week, come to church. If you have used your two kindness stickers, meaning you've done two acts of kindness to somebody, you can, to two people, you can have your two stickers on you. If you have two stickers on you next week, I will have a gift for you. Because the two stickers mean I've acted kind to somebody else. Well, what is it to act kind to somebody else? Go ahead, honey. What'd she say? Be generous to somebody, right. Well, how about you see an old man walking through the doorway <laughs> at Chili's, and you say, that guy's awful slow. I'm going to beat him to the door and get through. No. Open the door. Let the person. Oh. You see somebody at uh, Walmart trying to get a, one of the, the uh, carts, shopping carts. Go grab a cart for them and give them a cart. Show them that you're thinking of them. Oh, here's one you might think of. You see mom or dad doing the dishes. Have you ever just hobbled on up and said, can I help doing the dishes? I think your mother or father will have a heart attack and fall on the floor. No, they'll say, that is very kind of you. So I want you to practice Christian kindness this week. If you've done it two times, next Sunday, wear two stickers. If you're wearing two stickers, and if you forget your stickers, we'll have more stickers here. But don't come and make up stories that, oh, I was very kind. I gave $1,000 to somebody this week. No, if you've done it, we'll give you a prize. I'll give you a prize. Because I want you to learn to be kind. Kindness to others shows the love of Jesus. The other incredible thing about it is when we do acts of kindness to others, we realize how much God is kind to us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for each of these children. I thank you that you are trying to guide them, seeking to guide them in the way of truth and of love, of kindness. And so teach them uh, these lessons that they will be effective witnesses, disciples of Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, amen. Thank you all.
morning, everyone. Good morning. And I lost my place in that. Uh, you want me to do Psalms first? Yes, and I'll do the oh, first okay. reading. Yeah. All right, uh, I'll be reading uh, from Psalms 63, verses 3 through 8. As soon as I wake my, there we go. They say technology doesn't work. <laughs> I got so here you go. Surprised. You, did you find it? Yes, it's right okay. here. I'm honed in on it now. Whoops. Everybody take a breather. Say hello to everybody else. I'll, I'll be with you. <laughs> Psalm 63, verse 3 through 8. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy, I will lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night, because you are my helper. I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. The strong right hand holds me secure. Thank you. Okay. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians 13, today being the second of five sermons on 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. We oftentimes hear these words read at weddings, but this is not a wedding description of a, a couple's love. This is the description of a Christian's life. Paul is describing how the love of Christ captures us and then is demonstrated in other practical ways in our life. So I'm going to read to you 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Let us pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of each person here be filled with your spirit that we might learn and implement our life as disciples of Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, amen. I beg your indulgence in my remaining seated as I deliver this message. Uh, I recognized and realized before that if I stand up for too long, I start to break into sweats and I get faint. And I think, what am I going through, menopause? <laughs> no, my body isn't ready to stand a long time. So even as I did, delivered the children's sermon, I was starting to get sweaty. I thought, 
I'm not even going to attempt to deliver this sermon standing. But I want to talk about how kindness demonstrates the love of Christ to others. Loving people is not easy. You know full well that pe people can be vow breakers, truth benders, and backstabbers. Yet Jesus tells us to love others in the very same way that he loves us. We readily remember the stories of Jesus' miracles, of many of his teachings, and particularly his passion, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. However, we are not quick to remember that his life was cloaked in a kindness that demonstrated God's love to others. For instance, he attended a wedding in Canaan of Galilee where the host and the hostess had failed to provide enough wine for the guest. This was a major social faux pas, a destroyer of the wedding celebration, not enough wine. I'm sure the wedding couple thought that Jesus was really a nice guy because Jesus went and turned the water into wine. What an act of kindness. Another story is about a tax collector who stood up, or sat up in a sycamore tree as Jesus came through his village. He was not a tall fellow, so he could not stand in the crowd. But more importantly, he was a despised individual because Zacchaeus was a tax collector. As Jesus walked through the village, the villagers kept a distance from Zacchaeus, an outcast, an enemy of the people, as he collected taxes for the Romans. But who does Jesus pick out in the crowd? Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house today. The rest of the crowd might have been shocked. Zacchaeus understood it as an act of kindness. And there was a middle-aged woman who we're told had been sick for over a dozen years and had spent all her money on doctors trying to, to get better in medicines. Long ago, she had lost all hope. One day, she heard that Jesus was passing through her town. So as the crowd of people surrounded Jesus, she could not get close to him, so she got on her knees, crawled as close as she could, reached out through the crowd just to touch the garment of Jesus. Who would have noticed that somebody was touching their clothes in a crowd? But Jesus immediately said to his disciples, Who touched me? He sensed his power go out. They brought the woman before him. She fell at his feet, trembling, fearful that she would be punished for merely touching this holy man. Jesus spoke gently to her, calling her daughter, a term of affection. He welcomed her into his family, and his power healed her body. It was his kindness that changed her life. Whoever met Jesus experienced the power of God's love through Jesus' kindness. The Apostle Paul wrote the words that I just read to you from 1 Corinthians 13. Love is kind. The psalmist recognized the depth of God's love or God's kindness when he, the psalmist David penned the words, your loving kindness 
is better than life. Meaning, he's saying, one of the best things in life is the kindness of God. You know, ancient farmers trained inexperienced young oxen by yoking them to an experienced ox with a wooden harness that went across both their shoulders. The straps around the older experienced ox were drawn tight so that the older ox would carry most of the load. The young ox, the one being trained, wore a loose harness, but he'd still be attached to the experienced oxen. So the young ox would walk alongside the old ox, making the young ox's burden light, but the young ox learning how to carry the load. Jesus says to you, I walk beside you. We, meaning you and Jesus, are yoked together. Jesus said, I'll pull the heavy load. You just stay along and learn from me. Have you thought about how many burdens Jesus is carrying for you right now? He released you from the shame of your sins. No matter what you've done, he still says to you, I love you. He placed your anxiety on his shoulders because you were too weary to carry it any longer. You worried, will I get better? Will I have enough money? Will my children still care for me after they leave the house? Is my job secure? Jesus said, I'll carry those burdens with you. He lifted some of your fears before you even realized how dangerous they would be in your life. He carried your confusion so you wouldn't feel lost and unwanted. Do you remember that time in your life? How often have you thanked him for his kindness? Probably not very often. But you're failing to give Christ thanks for his kindness has not restricted or limited his kindness to you. His kindness continues because he, the scriptures say, he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Did you realize that? Jesus doesn't just love the good people. He's kind to everyone. Do you think there's ever been a time in your life that Jesus was so busy that he didn't have time to extend kindness to you? Hasn't he helped you out in several of your life's jams, disappointments? Hasn't he gone into your family and healed broken relationships? I could sit here, I couldn't stand, I could sit here three, four hours and tell you stories of how Jesus has healed broken relationships in my family. And I realize it was in his time, in his way, but through his power that his kindness was extended to me. 
So his kindness lifts our spirits and then should prompt us to be kind to others. Now, being kind may not sound like a manly quality. I know most of us men sitting here, <coughs> me beep, strong, me beep, beep. Me not kind, me take control. Well, kindness is neither a male or a female attribute. It is a Christian attribute given by God to you for the purpose of your sharing it with others. We may attend conferences on dynamic leadership, on winning strategies, on effective management. Has anyone here ever attended a conference on kindness? Raise your hand. I'd like to go to one. Has anybody, seriously, ever attend a conference on kindness? All right. Raise your hand if you think we need more kindness in this world. All right, I've got all but three of you. Okay. <laughs> Jesus says to us, go and learn what this means. He challenged the Pharisees and the religious leaders. God wants kindness more than your sacrifice. What does that mean in your life? God wants your kindness displayed more and any sacrifice you can make. So where do you place kindness in your priorities of living like Jesus Christ? When was the last time you did something unexpectedly kind for a member of your own family? Have you ever said something to your boss at work that demonstrates kindness? Maybe what she or he needs is a little bit of encouragement from some kind words. Kind hearts are quietly kind. They are the ones who lets the young mom with three children come forward in the checkout line because you see she's not only trying to get her groceries through, she's trying to maintain the herd that's running around. Kind hearts recognize that possibly the neediest person they meet all week is the person sitting alone in church on Sunday. The Apostle Paul said to the early Christians, when you have the opportunity to help anyone, do it. And then he adds these words, but give special attention, he said, to those who are in the family of God. I pray the Holy Spirit convicts you as you're walking out of church today and you see somebody and you say, I think the Lord's telling me I need to say a kind word to that person. Try it and see what happens. Now admittedly, it isn't easy being kind. We tend to think that genuine kindness must be spontaneous. The opposite is true. Kindness usually is 
conscientious, deliberate, and sacrificial. Let me say it again. Kindness usually is conscientious, deliberate, and sacrificial. The Bible tells, tells us that kindness is the fruit of the Holy Spirit working within us. That means Christian kindness is motivated by God and energized by the Spirit's love within us. It just doesn't happen spontaneously. It's God at work in you through others. Kindness demonstrates Christ-like love because it changes the life of the other while at the same time impacting the life of the giver. Kindness impacts the life of the other by impacting the life of the giver at the same time. Listen to this final story about the power of kindness. Every time I read this story, I get broken up. So I gotta get my courage up. That's probably the pills I'm taking. Mrs. Thompson stood in front of her fifth grade class and told a lie the very first day. As she eyeballed the new students, she told them that she loved all of them. That was untrue. Because there was a little boy named Teddy Stoddard in the front row about whom she had already received negative reports and she had formed a negative opinion. Teddy's clothes were messy. He constantly needed a bath. And he continually feuded with the other children. As the school year progressed, Mrs. Thompson would actually take delight in marking his papers with a big red F. She grew increasingly annoyed with this student in her class. One day, while fulfilling the quarterly requirement of reviewing each student's progress, she was surprised by what she found in Teddy's file. Teddy's first grade teacher had written, Teddy is a bright child. He does his work neatly, and has good manners. He is a joy to be around. Teddy's second grade teacher wrote this report. Teddy is an excellent student, well liked by his classmates, but he is having trouble because his mother is terminally ill and life at home has become a struggle. His third grade teacher wrote, Teddy's mother's death has been hard on him. He tries to do his best, but his father doesn't show much interest. And his home life will soon affect his, him if steps aren't taken to assist him. Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy is withdrawn and doesn't show much interest in school. He doesn't have any friends in the class and he sleeps in school. Mrs. Thompson instantly realized the problem and she was immediately ashamed of herself. She felt even worse when her students bought in decoratively wrapped Christmas presents. All except Teddy. His present was clumsily wrapped in a grocery bag. 
Mrs. Thompson took pains to unwrap it in the middle of the other presents. Some of the other students laughed when she found a rhinestone bracelet with most of the stones missing and a bottle that was one quarter full of a cheap perfume. But she stifled the children's laughter and she put the bracelet on and exclaimed it to be pretty. And then she dabbed some of the perfume on her neck. Teddy stayed after school that day just long enough to say to Mrs. Thompson, you smell just like my mother used to smell. Afterward, Mrs. Thompson cried for an hour. That very day, Mrs. Thompson quit teaching, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Instead, she began to teach children. She paid particular attention to Teddy. Slowly, his mind seemed to come alive. And by the end of the year, Teddy was one of the smartest kids in the class. A year later, she found a note under her classroom door. A note from Teddy telling her she was still the best teacher he ever had. Six years later, she got another note from Teddy. He wrote that he had just finished high school, number three in his class. And she was still the best teacher he ever had. Four years later, she got another letter saying that things had been tough at times, but he had stuck with it and he would soon graduate with highest honors from college. He added, and you guessed it, she was still the best teacher he ever had. Four more years passed, and yet another letter came. It said that Teddy had gotten another degree, and she was still the best teacher he ever had. But now his name was a little longer. A letter was signed, Theodore F. Stoddard, medical doctor. The story does not end there. The next spring, Mrs. Thompson received a letter saying that Teddy was getting married. He explained that his father had died a couple years ago, and he was wondering if Mrs. Thompson would sit in the seat where the mother traditionally sits at the wedding. Of course, Mrs. Thompson did. And guess what? She wore the rhinestone bracelet with many stones missing. Moreover, she was sure to wear the same perfume that Teddy had gave her in the fifth grade. After the wedding, they hugged each other and Dr. Stoddard whispered in her ear, thank you, Mrs. Thompson, for believing in me and making me feel important. With tears in her eyes, Mrs. Thompson whispered back, Teddy, you have it all wrong. You were the one who taught me that I could make a difference. I didn't know how to teach until I met you. lesson is simple. Kindness has the power to change lives. There are a lot of people 
some even sitting here today in church, who are hungering to receive the kindness of Jesus Christ through you. Let Christ's love flow through you to others. And you'll watch lives being changed. Let's pray. Father, we talk about faith. We talk about goodness and we talk about truth. And yet the message of your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, is that it's about your love, changing lives, giving us strength through the difficult obstacles of life, giving us courage as we face the challenges, giving us hope as we see physical life draw to an end, knowing that your promise is, it, is for eternity. And that in you, there is eternal love. Help us, Lord, to be faithful disciples. Hear us now as we join together in the prayer that our Savior taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue our worship through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. Lord, receive these gifts from thankful hearts and use these gifts now to glorify you that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee might bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord of all. Amen.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen.